chance have any of you read this week's passage? Did you did you look ahead? Yeah. Any of you? Very good. Okay. It's good to hear that some of you had. It's always a good idea. That's one of the reasons I work through a Bible like this, so that you can do that kind of thing. You know where I'm going. Um, I kind of hope that maybe this would be one of those weeks where you might have done that, so I might benefit, because as you would have read this passage, you might have had a thought like, oh, this will be fun. <laughs> oh, Pastor Dan. <laughs> He's got his work cut out for him today, right? This is actually a pretty famous passage. It says a couple of things in it that are fairly difficult to interpret. And then even if we interpret, explaining that and applying it is sort of another challenge. Now, on one hand, there is a central truth that can be gleaned from this passage fairly easily. We can see very clearly the way this overall fits into the context of Peter's letter. He's talking about suffering and and, and the way Christian pilgrims must endure that in this world. And he points us to Christ and his example. And, and so this passage starts by pointing us to the suffering of Christ. It ends by pointing us to the conquering of Christ. And so it's not hard to see there, and as I've reflected in the sermon title, a, a straight line, if you will, from suffering to conquering. Right? I could just preach that message and walk away. And like, yeah, that's nice, right? The unique thing, however, is the way Peter gets from suffering to conquer it, right? He very briefly calls two things to the mind of the reader that we might say are cans of worms, both of them. There are aspects of the ministry of Christ that we think about regularly, and there are aspects of the ministry of Christ that I think are missing sometimes. And my suspicion is that what he wrote in this passage would not have been as confusing to the original reader as it is to us. And that one of the reasons it is so difficult for us is because of our neglect. <clears throat> one scholar actually tells a story a day that he was visiting a church that just happened to be going through 1 Peter. And he learned that they were in chapter 3 of the service, and the pastor stood up and said, today's text was going to be 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22, but it's really weird, so I'm going to skip it. <laughs> All right? So um, I'm not following that example. It's God's Word, right? My job is to preach the whole counsel of God's Word and not skip passages that are uncomfortable or difficult. So it's been fun. But it's been more than that, too. And I say this by way of a, a disclaimer of sorts. In order to wade through some of the, the depths of this passage, parts of today's message will feel more like a classroom than a pulpit and sermon and a you know, bring in the heat kind of thing. But I promise you, if you hang in there with me, it's to get somewhere. Right? And this passage, as I've been working through it this week, has actually been a wonderful encouragement to me. And I hope that it will be to you as well. But we're not going to cheat. We're not going to go all the way for the feel goods at the end. All right, We're going to earn it today. By, by bringing our minds and loving the Lord, not just with all of our hearts, but with all of our minds. So I want to challenge you to, to go on this little journey with me. We're going to talk about Greek. We're going to talk about ancient literature. We're going to have to do that kind of thing. So that we can understand God's word to us today. If you'll trust me and trust the Lord, it'll be worth it. So with that being said, let's pray and let's dive into it. Father, I ask that you would help us. And because this morning it has fallen to me to stand up here and be the teacher of your word, that you would be with me in a special way. I ask that you would give me strength, the grace, that you would make your power perfect in my weakness. I am well aware of how I fall short, and I take great comfort today in knowing that I do not have to present myself to you on the basis of my merit, but of yours. For that grace, I thank you, and I worship you today. And I ask that you would do this work in our hearts in drawing the sheep to the great shepherd that you are. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I'm going to work through today's text by following, focusing on four aspects of the ministry of Christ. Two of these will be very familiar to you. We refer to them often, the death and the resurrection of Christ. They're inseparable even, many times. We refer to them just like that, the death and resurrection of Christ. But there are a couple of aspects of the ministry of Christ that are addressed in this passage that we often don't speak of very much. One of them is what happens after the resurrection. We call that the ascension of Christ. Now, sometimes we refer to it, right? We, we, we go the next step. But I don't think we think of it nearly as often as the death and resurrection. But it certainly gets a mention from time to time. But almost never in the, in the common conversation do we refer to the ministry of Christ, that, 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 that little brief period between his death and resurrection. Right? Well, Peter does. And today he's actually going to address this aspect of its ministry, not just this brief little window of time as it did something then, but the way it impacts us today. And he expects the Christian pilgrim to live in light of the ministry that was performed in that little window of time. So we're going to look today at these four aspects of his ministry. The death on the cross, his descent into the underworld, his resurrection as depicted in water baptism, and ultimately his ascension into heaven. Now those are the four. If you didn't catch all that, don't worry. I'll shout them out as we go through the text. I want to point this out before we start to dive into it, that today's text is also a wonderful complement to a passage where Peter has already addressed the suffering of Christ. That is in chapter 2. Beginning in verse 21, there he writes this. For to, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And by his wounds, you have been healed. In that passage, Peter was drawing from Isaiah 53 and demonstrating for us the way that Christ fulfilled this prophecy as the suffering servant of the Lord. And characteristically, the verses that he quotes point to his meekness in suffering, to his self-sacrifice in suffering. Now returning to the issue of Christ's suffering, however, Peter's going to make sure we understand that's not the whole story. That's not the only lesson for you to learn about how we are to suffer and follow the example of Christ in suffer. Because our Christ is not only meek, he is not only self-sacrificial, he is a conquering king. And today, we're going to look at that side of the ministry of Christ in his suffering. He is the conqueror, not the conquered. So the first aspect of this ministry, and one that sort of scratches us all where we itch, is the death of Christ as seen on the cross. And you see that in verse 18. I'll read it again. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So he suffered. That is to say, he died a death that he did not deserve to die. One that was depicted in Isaiah, one that Peter referred to in chapter 2. No greater crime against a human had ever been committed than to put this innocent man to death and in such a shameful, torturous fashion. He did this, but importantly, we understand that the death that he experienced, he, he, he did it once. Because Jesus, our great high priest, when he makes the payment as atonement for sin, he's not like the priest of old who had to do it again next year. Because Christ, who lived in perfect righteousness, yielded himself to the Father in all things when he submitted himself and offered his life on our behalf one time was good enough for all forever. 
And when this happened, there was an exchange of his righteousness for ours. Right? We were evil. You understand this. We crucified him. Forget the historical discussions about was it Rome, was it the Jewish Sanhedrin? It was us. We drove the nails. And in exchange for paying for our sin, he grants to us his righteousness. Why? Well, the text says that he might bring us to God. Now, this turns out to be a technical term. And in Peter's day, this was a term that referred to the gaining of an audience in a court. As best I understand it, it seems to be something like an attorney calling to the stand someone to bear witness. And so what Peter is depicting here is the way Christ brings us to God or calls us into court that we might get an audience with God. Are you scared yet? You are called to stand before a holy God. But what we know from Peter and elsewhere is that for the Christian, the one who has been justified in the sight of God on virtue of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, this is a moment of great joy, not of terror. That's why he did it. That he would present us to God. There is one interpretive challenge, not too hard, but, but significant. And that is in this phrase at the end where he explains that this was through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he mentions, I have this out of order. Let me fix it in just a minute. About the way he was resurrected in spirit. <coughs> The challenge is spirit, lowercase s, or capital case. Are we referring to spirituality and the spirit realm or the person of the Holy Spirit? So I think the internal coherence of the text and some of the work of scholars that I read a little bit this week, I think strongly suggests an interpretation that favors the lowercase version. That in this verse, this is not a reference to the person of the Holy Spirit, but the simple reality of uh, of the contrast between flesh and spirit. So a suggested translation might be something like this, that he is, was being put to death with reference to the flesh, but made alive with reference to the spirit. What, what the reader is being set up to understand is a, con, is a contrast between flesh and spirit. And of course, when it comes to our worship and our walk, the writers of the New Testament play on this quite often. The war, we might say, between the flesh, the desires of the flesh, and the spirit. Jesus himself even makes some reference to this in Matthew 26. There in the garden, when he says to his disciples, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So this is a, a category of distinction that even Jesus himself makes. So what this seems to indicate here is that before Christ experienced bodily resurrection on Resurrection Sunday, that his spirit was made alive. He, he experienced some kind of resurrection in the spirit. <clears throat> one that probably is a foreshadow of part of what we get to enjoy. While one day we look forward to getting new glorified bodies before that, the believer, upon death, is separated from their body, but is resurrected spiritually and gets to enjoy the presence of the Lord in anticipation of that glorification. I think this interpretation demonstrates the continuity of the work of Christ, which is to say that when he died, that this time between death and resurrection, it's not like he wasn't doing anything, right? Because he was made alive in the spirit. It also is going to set us up for a better understanding of what's coming. I'll point that out as we go. So this is a part of the text, part of the ministry of Christ that we celebrate. We're used to this, right? This is preaching, right? Now, we're going to get a little weird. Verse 19. We're going to talk here about the descent of Christ to the underworld. So, Alive with reference to the Spirit, we then read this. 
in this spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patient waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Now I've shared with you this is a challenging passage, and I, I'm taking comfort in knowing that I'm in good company. Martin Luther famously said of this text, I do not know just what Peter means. <laughs> three primary views on how to handle this text, and of course within these three, there are going to be a lot of nuanced views. One is that Jesus preached after his bodily death, in spirit, to those who perished in the flood of Noah. And that this was a gospel message. It was an opportunity to repent and get right with God. Uh, this was a view espoused by Origen and some others. Another view is the view of Augustine, which says that when Noah was preaching, that it was actually Christ preaching through him, or what Peter refers to in this letter as the spirit of Christ. Because Peter does say that, that when the prophets were speaking, it was the Spirit of Christ speaking in and through them. So Augustine, or Augustine, says that's what was going on. This is just Peter's way of saying that when Noah was preaching all those years ago, that it was empowered by the person of Christ. And then there's the third view, which is that, he was, that these spirits imprisoned are what we might call fallen angels. And then what Jesus went to do was to proclaim to them, to announce to them that he had secured his own victory. That the content of his preaching, of his proclamation, was not a gospel one. It was something like this. Nana, nana, boo, boo. <laughs> and not only because I like to think of Jesus saying nana, nana, boo, boo, but for many other reasons, I strongly favor the third interpretation. And one of the reasons I think that this is so weird to the modern reader is just because that's uncomfortable for us. And to me, that's the simplest explanation for why we have struggled with passages like this. I think you can prove almost beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is what Peter has in mind. First, let's consider Peter's comments in his second letter, in chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, where he, where he speaks again about this descendant time in the ministry of Christ and links it also with the sin that led up to the flood. In 2 Peter 2, 4 and 5, he writes, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, hmm, what could that be? Right? But cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, so this is Noah's time, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of ungodly. So Peter, in his second letter, links two judgments. The judgments of the angels that sinned, which he threw into hell. But in contrast to that, Noah and his family, he saved. Okay? Jude, half-brother of Jesus, in his one-chapter epistle, Asserts in verse 6 about the angels who did not stay with their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. He has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So it refers to the same event of these angels who sinned, which God threw in prison to keep them there until a final judgment on the great day. And then in addition to the verses I've just read, we have the complement, if you will, of, I'll say, uninspired, but nevertheless helpful works of literature that the original readers would have believed much of, maybe not all, but would have believed some of it, would have informed their worldview, and would have, they would have been familiar with these, that elucidate for us very key aspects of what Peter and Jude would have believed about the world and that of their audience. One in particular goes by the name of First Enoch. I'm sure that some of you have heard it. In that book, again, extra biblical, not inspired, but an important piece of literature that would have informed their worldview. 
in chapter 6 of that book, which corresponds to chapter 6 of Genesis, the beings there who sinned to produce offspring with the sons of Adam, or with the daughters, I should say, the daughters, were not called angels in this passage, or sons of God, but rather watchers. This is referred to as the sin of the watchers. And by the way, watchers is a term that Daniel uses in his letter. So this is not alien to the writers of Scripture. And so in the lead up to Noah's flood, it was these being the watchers who committed this grievous, grievous sin. And that, by the way, from this book, 1 Enoch, Jude, who references the sin in verse 6, I read it to you just a few verses later, quotes directly from 1 Enoch. He directly quotes it. So I think it's kind of a slam dunk case that when Peter and Jude write about this topic, they're writing it with this understanding of the supernatural interpretation of Genesis 6. And in that story, well, first I should say, and in the Bible, one of the things that we learn about Enoch is how he walked with God, and then God took him. How cool is that? Well, the Enoch of, e of the book of 1 Enoch he had this kind of special status, right? Because he didn't have to die. He walked with God and then God took him. And so in that book, he has something of a special mediatorial status. And so the watchers appeal to Enoch. Hey, you're, you're special, right? Can you appeal to us, to God, to, to get us out of this mess? And he says, sure, I'll do that for you. So he goes to God and God says, nana, nana, boo, boo. You go back and you tell him no. And so that's what First Enoch depicts. That the sin of the watchers was unforgivable. That, that the kind of sin that they committed was so grotesque and was in such violation of God's plan for the world and for Adam and all of creation that even when they appealed to be set free from this prison the gloomy darkness, God said no. And the writer of Hebrews affirms this when he says, For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Salvation, redemption, the shed blood of Christ is for sons of Adam and Eve, not angels. So not only does he say, tell them no, he says, send them back. I'm sending you back, Enoch, you know, with a message to preach to the spirits in prison. You lost. Right? That was the message. Right? You thought when you heard me bless Adam or curse Adam, curse Eve, curse the servant, but promise that through the seed of the woman one would come who would deliver the fatal blow, you thought, well, all I have to do is corrupt that seed. And you thought it would work. Guess what? You lost. So in that sense, when now Peter writes that Jesus preaches to the spirits in prison, it's a very strong allusion to what Enoch did in that book. He preached to spirits in prison a message along the lines of nana nana boo boo. And in that way, Jesus is now the better Enoch. Right? So the writer of Hebrews, he's the better Moses, right? He's the better Aaron. He's the better covenant. He's also the better Enoch. Right? So all these figures, we call them types, they foreshadow what Christ would do. Right? So all the great heroes, all the great works that we find in the Old Testament, they all point us to the one who will do the best version of all of those things. And Christ also, he's the better, the better, the better, he's the better Enoch. And so this message that he comes is something like this. You tried it way back then. You thought you could corrupt the seed. And then you thought when I was killed that you had won. Guess what? I'm here. It didn't work. Shame on you. And he gets an assist from Paul in Colossians 2 where he says, By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Amen. Right? That is part of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Victory. He exposed 
the hater of your soul, to great shame. You thought you could win. How foolish were you? I won again. And this is what Peter wants his readers to think about. Jesus, the one who after having this victory on the cross, after securing a redemption, a path to reconciliation, being brought to God, not only that, remember that Jesus wasn't done. He went on to preach doom and gloom to those who hate you the most. They belong to me now, and I am here to shame you. God has this pattern that we see in the Bible of great long suffering. He can wait so long. In the story of Noah, he, we know that he had already been putting up with humanity and their descent into chaos and evil for many generations. And even by the time he spoke to Noah, he says, look, Noah, this is it. I'm starting over with you. He waited yet another 120 years. And we talked about this on Wednesdays, but even when Jesus would promise the promised land to Abraham. He said, but there's these people there and they're really evil, but their evil has not yet come to its climax. So I'm going to wait another 400 years. That's mercy. In Romans 3, Paul writes about God's mercy towards us. That God in his mercy had up till now, up to the cross, been doing something. Passing over, he called it. In his mercy, he was passing over sins previously committed. But in the, in the mind and in the theology of Paul, that was the potential injustice of God. Not that he would be a God who would punish evil, but that he would be a God who wouldn't. This puts God on the hook as potentially being unjust because he's been so merciful. Paul was, was writing as if God had been too merciful. Right? So how did God solve that problem? By putting Christ forward as a propitiation on our behalf. Right? And so that when this happens, when his blood goes up as a sign that the payment has been made, it makes God both just because he punishes the sin, but also the justifier of the one who has faith. Right? So, so the cross is a demonstration of the wrath of God the justice of God, but also the love and the mercy of God. And no, it wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But the Bible calls him a preacher of righteousness. And I, I take some comfort in this as a preacher, in remembering that he preached, he's remembered well, 120 year preaching ministry and not one convert. But he secured the commendation of God because he drew near to God in faith. That is to say, he believed God and took him at his word. And for that reason, because he trusted Yahweh, God says, come on, Noah. And we read about him in Hebrews 11 along with many of the great heroes of the faith. This last phrase, before we move on, through water, is going to be a key point of connection to this next aspect of Christ's ministry, another challenge for us. And this is the resurrection of Christ as depicted in water baptism. So the first part, you're like, yay, resurrection. But what does that have to do with water baptism? This is a, a difficult verse for some, and it's my... It's my job, but in some sense my joy to work through it with you today, and I hope clarify some things as we do. Here's what it says, verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Right? That's the big phrase that scares a lot of people. Is he saying that we must be baptized in order to be saved? That's the big question. But notice that Peter immediately clarifies what I'm not saying and what I am saying. He says... Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's where he connects the resurrection of Jesus Christ as it's depicted in water baptism. 
So like I said, Peter makes a point of clarifying his own remark. Right? It does save you, but not in this certain sense. Right? But in this sense. Right? And we need to, this is good for us, right? As we're trying to be good students of God's word and understand that salvation is not only about justification. Right? Justification is, is the legal status that we have before God. It's what gives us the right to be called sons of God. It's what gives us the right to enter into his presence after we're parted from our bodies. But salvation entails much more than just justification. And I believe that what Peter is saying is here is I'm not talking about baptism as salvation justification, but as salvation in the realm of sanctification. Okay? So sanctification is the ongoing work through the Holy Spirit to make the believer more and more like Christ, more and more holy. It's a process. In some sense, we can rightly say and stand on the authority of Scripture that when we're justified, we were saved. And as we're being sanctified, we're being saved. And we look forward to a day when we will be glorified or we will be saved. We are saved, being saved, and will be saved. And he is saying baptism it correlates to salvation, not the justification part, but the sanctification part. And this makes sense because he already addressed the justification part, the cross, and bringing us to God. That's the language of justification. But now when it comes to living righteously, which has been a major point in this letter, he's relooking really to the aspect of salvation we often call sanctification. You see, because there's something else we need. And Peter got a really powerful lesson in this. And we talked about it last week, if you were here for our communion, right? At the bush washing, what did Jesus explain to his disciples? You know, he, he washed their feet and Peter objected, right? Peter objected to Lord Jesus. This is wrong, right? You're the greater, I'm the lesser. My job is to wash your feet. And Jesus is like, no, you don't understand. You can't have fellowship with me. Unless I wash your feet. And they say, oh, well, I'm all in then. Wash me all. But then guess what? Jesus corrects them again. No, Peter, you don't understand. You're already clean. All right? Justified. But there's this other thing that you need, don't you? You don't just need to be presented to God with the righteousness of myself on your account. You need fellowship. <coughs> You need the ongoing intimacy. You know, it's not just about believing so you can convert. It's about abiding in him so you can grow. And, and that's what the foot washing is meant to communicate. It's one of the things that we need to continue to spend time at the feet of Jesus. Abiding in him. Growing in him. In this passage... This is referred to as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Now the word here, appeal, I, I don't think that's a good translation. I'm not the expert, but others are. And, it, and this word seems to be best translated pledge. Which, by the way, this might make some of you uncomfortable. That's actually how the NIV translates it. Right? This isn't an appeal as though it's a request. It's a pledge. It's a statement. All right? That's, a diff that's different. One is like a plea, may I have a good conscience. The other one is a statement, a pledge, a commitment, a sacrifice. Right? Here's what I'm going to do. It is a pledge for a good conscience. Now, how do you do that? Right? A, a, a pledge to have a good conscience is, is in essentially a pledge to live sacrificially, live in a way that you're pursuing holiness so that you can have a clear conscience. Right? This is sanctification language. So, in other words, baptism, what he's saying here, is a pledge to live in such a way that our conscience is clear. It is a statement. It is a sign of devotion, of commitment, of loyalty, of obedience, and holiness. Which is what Peter has been emphasizing all through this letter. Be holy as I am holy. So baptism is to be the outward demonstration, the response, what God has done. I'm now committing myself to this process of sanctification. And here's how this connects to Noah.
There's no proof of salvation without resurrection. That's why we don't merely talk about the cross, we talk about the empty tomb. The empty tomb is proof that his payment was sufficient. The empty tomb is proof that he actually had the power to do what he said he had the power to do, to conquer death. In some sense, water baptism illustrates the importance of the resurrection. Right? The ark gave new life to Noah and his family. And, and honestly, to all of us. To all of humanity. New life. Right? So for 40 days and 40 nights, God is judging the earth. And, and they are spared, we might even say justified, by being in the ark. But when the ark lands, it's, it's in some sense a guarantee, a promise of new life. We're back on the ground, and we get to start over. And interestingly enough, we're actually told, and I'm so glad that God in his wisdom revealed this to us in the word, that the ark came to rest in the mountains of Ararat on the 17th day of the month. Right? So it's no longer in the waters of judgment. Right? That's past. Right? We're, we're back on the land on the 17th day of the month. We're also told that Christ was crucified on the 14th day of the month, which means he would have been resurrected on the 17th day of the month. So, so the resurrection of Christ corresponds to Noah and the saving from the ark when it landed on the ground. Right? Resurrection, think ark landing at the mountain. Right? We are, we are meant to think, look, new life, it's coming. And Paul beautifully makes this connection between resurrection and baptism in Romans 6. When he's just been sharing the gospel, he's been talking about freedom and all these things, and he anticipates the objection. And he raises it himself in chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Right. Is that what the gospel of grace is really about? That, that all of a sudden in the house of God we don't care about righteousness? Well, he says, by no means is that what I'm saying. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. We, therefore, were buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we, too, may live a new life. When you come out of the water, you're to think about the new life that he's given you. Right? Resurrection. It is a symbol of the resurrection and the new life that he grants. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. This is present day. This is sanctification. right? We were justified so that we could enjoy sanctification. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. The whole purpose of God's grace, the whole purpose of being set free is so that we can live freely. And, and that freedom is about being free from the grip of sin's power. It, it's there so that you can live a holy life. The idea is that before the cross you couldn't. There was no hope for you. All you had was effort. But now we have the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. And by that power, does he make us holy? Christ himself refers to his own suffering and resurrection as a baptism. Sometimes referring to it as a cup. Right? So you see it there. And then he even says in Luke 12, verse 50... I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how great is my distress until it is accomplished. So Christ was baptized, not just by John the Baptist, but, but he was baptized by the wrath of God. 
And he came out on the other side with new life. And when we die with him, we are raised with him. So Christian baptism stresses the completion of this work and its connection to the resurrection. That's why whenever we explain it, we often say that what baptism is, is an outward demonstration of an inward reality. We are celebrating the work that he has already done, already clean, justified, presented to God, holy in his sight. And it is a pledge of obedience, of commitment to identify and abide in Christ. Finally, we get to the ascension of Christ into heaven. Verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Note first, the use of the term angels, authorities, and powers. These are all offices of beings who occupy the unseen realm. And I think that this is further evidence of the supernatural interpretation of this passage. That he was preaching to these spirits in prison and now he rules over them. The big thing that I want to stress about this passage is that the ministry of Christ did not end with the resurrection. Right? Easter is a great message, and we should live in light of that all year. But that's not the last great work that he did. The ascension of Jesus Christ is a major emphasis of Luke in particular. He writes about it in Luke and in Acts. And his ascension, one of the great reasons that we ought to be thinking about it more, is because his ascension is meant to point us to his return. Right? Right? You know, we're, we're going to the Christmas season, right? We're thinking about the first time he came. But when he left, he reminded us, the way you see me go, I'll come back. Right? So there's a sense in which we're longing for the next Christmas. Right? And so he comforts his disciples with this. I'll be back. Right? And all signs point to this having occurred, the ascension on Mount Olive. Because it says that he was in Bethany, that's just east of Jerusalem, that's up the mountain, that's, that's basically the Mount of Olives. So if he's ascending there and he's saying, and the way you see me go, I'll return, he's, I believe, saying, you know the prophet Zechariah that talked about the day that the Son of Man would come on this mountain? Yeah, that'll be me. Zechariah says this, on the day his feet, right, this isn't a symbol. This isn't spirituality. This, on the day his feet, shall stand on the Mount of Olives. On that day, living water shall flow out of Jerusalem, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Right? We sing joy to the world today. You know that's not really a Christmas song, in my view. It's a second coming song, which makes it perfect for today. <laughs> He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. It's the ascension that points us to that day. It's the ascension that, that reminds us of the fact that he's not done working. And this is a major emphasis by the author of Hebrews. Let me give you a little sample of it. Early in the letter, he says, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And in this glorified state, the Father himself declares, Your throne, O God, so he calls his Son, God. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. And in this place, having brought with him many sons to glory, very similar to what Peter writes in bringing us to God. So here in Hebrews, having brought many sons to glory, he also says of the redeemed, so this is now the Redeemer himself speaking, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Right? He's not ashamed to call us brothers. So, so after his death, his dissension, his resurrection, his ascension, his return to the majesty on high, part of what he's doing in bringing us into that glorified state 
and sing our praises. They're my brothers. And there he works. He's still doing ministry. He works now as our great high priest. And because of that, the writer says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Remember I told you the word here for help is a technical, it's a sailing term. It refers to the ropes that go around it to keep it together. When the waves come and the boat's about to fall apart, it's frapping, all right? Jesus, our great high priest, is our frapping. He helps us keep it together when the storms come. And because his priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek, which means he serves as both a priest and a king, he is himself the guarantor of a better covenant. You see, Moses, anyone, David or whomever, any covenant could not operate in both of these capacities the way Jesus can. Right? Jesus gets to be not just a mediator of the covenant as a priest, but the guarantor of the covenant. Because he's the one making it. He has this authority as both king and priest. So, therefore, he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. And not only is our Redeemer depicted as a seated king in Hebrews, but in Revelation 5, he is, a, he is standing. In that great scene, John is granted a vision of heaven. He's granted access to the throne of God at a moment in time where it appears that God is about to finally establish his final kingdom. There's a scroll. It functions as something as a title deed to the earth. And it was sealed. And all, all creation needed was someone worthy to open its seals and take the scroll. And no one was found worthy. And the text tells us that when John saw this vision, he wept bitterly. And I feel that so deeply in my spirit. When you understand what that moment is, it's the closest you can get to vindication and not get it. It's the closest you can get to salvation and not yet feel it. We're so close. It's right there for the taking. We just need someone worthy to take it. And so after these thousands of years of people crying out for justice, after thousands of years of suffering, out of living in the, in the chaos of, of, of the world brought to us by Adam's sin, we just need one who's worthy. And no one was found, so he wept bitterly. But then he's told, don't weep anymore. And he looks. The angel says, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. And he went and took the scroll. Amen. He takes the scroll from the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. And when the Lamb of God stands, we bend our knees. And that's what the rest of Revelation 5 depicts. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. If you have believed in the gospel, you are saved. You are being saved. And you will be saved. All because you are in Christ. And so I want to encourage you today to press on, pilgrim. Knowing that in light of his death on the cross, the shedding of his righteous blood as payment for your sin... The, the moment that you are brought before the presence of God, you will stand with great joy, faultless, 
press on in light of his descent into the underworld to taunt the great deceiver. Your greatest enemy is a defeated foe. Do you know that? Press on in light of his resurrection and celebrate every day that you can the conquering of death that he achieved. And in the moment, cling to that hope of a total freedom from the grip of sin. And until that day, we lay our lives down as a pledge of obedience. And in light of his ascension, press on and take comfort in knowing that Christ is king. He rules and he reigns. The nations will rage. They will scoff. They will conspire. They will do everything they can to get in the face of God and destroy his people and the city that he loves. But the one who sits in heaven laughs. He scoffs. And he's coming. His feet will land once again on the Mount of Olives. And until he comes, we can live in light of this fact that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves us. And so I urge you, don't throw away your hope. It has great reward. And when I say that, I put a capital R on reward, right? Because it's a proper noun, right? Don't throw away your hope, which has great reward. The reward is him, right? That's the reward, we draw near to him in understanding that what he grants is more of himself. And if you hear his voice today, do not harden your hearts that you might enter his rest. And I want to encourage you that for the one who draws near to God in faith, there is for you, just like Christ in this passage, a straight line from suffering to triumph and to conquering. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And I can't think of a better place to end right there, so I'm just going to end. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, help us live in light of these grand truths. May we never lose the wonder of the cross May we not forget the victory that you have already achieved for us, the foes that you have already defeated, and the shame to which you have already exposed them. Father, help us to live in light and cling to the hope that we have in the resurrection. And the more and more we think about it, Lord, I ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we would learn to abide in you, to sacrifice our lives to you, to pledge ourselves to you as an act of worship and obedience. And Lord, and help us live in light of the fact that you are king, that you are ruling, that you rule and you reign in the hearts of your people when we look forward one day, when you will return, when you will make all things new, you will end death forever. And we will be with you. Lord, I, I rejoice with King David today. I don't know if he knew it when he wrote it that he was talking about you when he rejoiced that you did not abandon my soul to Sheol. You will not let your Holy One see corruption. For in your presence there is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So Lord, we cling today to what is forever and forever. And, and it's incomparable to anything that we experience in the now. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. May you work this power into our lives this season and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen.